Okay, so if all this seems a bit doom and gloom so far, there is some good news. Because the older one gets, then the wider one's choices become. At last, Bannon says, some dependencies can effectively become challenged and rejected, while others are actively sought and voluntarily assumed. So this is where the potential for social movements exist, uh, I believe. Even so, human beings are never entirely liberated from their past. And um, a quintessential sociological statement would be to say that our experience is the experience of being free and unfree at the same time. That's one, one thing that we need to understand in terms of social norms and values. In addition to all of that, and this is extremely important in terms of people who want to bring about social change, which is the argument that paying the price of change has got to make sense to the people who are thinking about changing. The cost must appear worthy of being paid, in other words. There must be something about making paying attractive, and that must eventually outweigh the apparent attractiveness of avoiding change. Okay, so, so far then, we've talked about the, the social construction of insiders. If there's a notion of inside, then obviously there's a notion of outside as well. Uh, so, as we've just seen, and academics will call this the dialectics of freedom and dependence, at some stages in our development and our social <coughs> life, there can be opportunities to choose groups. Because there's no suggestion in Bauman's account of socialization or any sociological account of socialization that the process itself can create an utterly, totally homogenous group. There's always some space to move. So therefore, after early challenges, as I said, we've got these greater chances to change groups and to even form them. And again, the potential for social movements is there. Still leaves the question about who gets to be the insiders and who gets to be the outsiders. But what we've got now is a kind of multi-group situation. And Bauman says in this multi-group situation, individuals often judge other members of humanity by some kind of imaginary line or a continuum based on the notion of social distance. Now variations in social distance also involve a decrease or increase in issues like empathy and fellow feeling, and that's based on mental and moral proximity. That in itself can be regulated or influenced by physical distance and psychic difference. So this is a recipe, if you like, a package, and what's really being said is that we're talking about the social construction of those very important moral in and moral out groups. We have a very nice feeling about the groups that are our we groups. We have a sense of belonging, but we don't feel the same about the they groups. Bauman is describing how the other can be seen as less morally valuable. <coughs> Others can be seen as strangers, who by definition, cases in which the moral proximity has been lessened, then that means our moral responsibility is likewise lessened as well. The lack of moral <coughs> proximity can increase the likelihood of overcoming or overriding what Bauman calls our animal pity. Our animal pity, he says, is generated by human beings just being with other human beings. We can override that by a lack of moral proximity. There are different levels of this idea of moral proximity. On a kind of lower level, if you like, we could call it something like civil inattention. The civil inattention is only a small step away from something more serious, like moral indifference, being indifferent about the plight of the other. Bauman says that both of those can lead to a certain heartlessness and a disregard for the needs of others. So, as I have implied throughout then, once constructed, our meaningful bar uh, barriers need, naturally enough, to be jealously or at least studiously guarded. Now, in terms of sociological convention, it's usual for us to focus on notions like social class and race and gender in order to explore social differences which may result in levels of inequality, and that's related to issues of ethics and morality. Bauman himself, interestingly for us, I suppose, 
appears to acknowledge that perhaps the deepest divide of all is the divide at the species level. For example, he argues that a human being is likely to remain as a moral subject if they can remain categorized as a human being in the first place. Bauman notes that humans have evolved notions that being human on its own entitles a subject to special treatment. This is the proper treatment reserved for human beings only, and of course something that we're trying to do something about uh, culturally, legally, etc., etc. As a building block or consequence of human rights thinking, this construction of proper treatment is so strong that Bauman claims this, that one may even say that the concept of moral object and human being have the same referent, their respective scopes overlap, another thing that we're trying to challenge. In terms of moral proximity and physical treatment, there is, of course, a flip side, and Bauman writes, whenever certain persons or categories of people are denied the rights to our moral responsibility, then they are treated as lesser humans, flawed humans, which is a big, um, a big theme in Bauman's work, uh, being flawed, not fully human, or downright non-human. So, if being just less than human can be a serious threat to our moral standing, then we just have to think about the thoroughly unforgiving status of non-human. Yeah. That pushes us further and furthest away from moral consideration. It can put, put us the furthest away from the likelihood of being treated as morally valuable, at least in a fundamental sense. And so, historically, some human communities, in fact, have called themselves names that literally mean human. And that automatically pushes other people on the outside, creates others there and then. Philosopher Mary Misley, for example, suggests that this casts the other outside of the boundary of ethical concern. And by the same token, Stephen Clark, another philosopher, says that human slaves have always been or regularly categorised as non-human animals, or at least as distant, beast-like barbarians, he says. For his part, going back to Bauman, and probably thinking about his, his own pretty disturbing analysis of the Holocaust, he says, our century has been notorious for the appearance of highly influential worldviews, so worldviews come back in there, that call for the exclusion of whole categories of the population classes, nations, races, religion, from the universe of moral obligations. Okay, let's bring this a little bit down to earth and a bit nearer to our concerns, perhaps, when we return then to Tom Reagan. Because from 